Welcome everybody to the Good Book Club. This is a special bonus event on Tuesday, November 1st at 7.30 p.m. We are super excited to see everybody here. This is going to be really good. Uh, before we get started with our actual event, we're going to very quickly go through a couple of upcoming events for our book club members. Mark your calendar as it says. Um, our book for, let's see, do I have it here? Yes. Our book this month on the 13th, Sunday at 11 a.m. is going to be a Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. This is a really awesome book. It is on audio, unlike our last book. So if you haven't already, grab a copy and join us for that. It's going to be a really good discussion led by Marty Lynn. Uh, we also have another um, bonus event. It's a lazy learner coming up on Tuesday the 15th. Um, we're kind of calling this a drink and draw. Um, our wonderful book club member, Karen, is going to be help us meet, helping us meet our inner artist with a cubism experience. And there are some supplies that we're going to want to bring. We'll post more about this on our different uh, various sites. Sheets of drawing paper, broad, fine, and ultra fine Sharpies. And we're going to meditate and draw and just experience um, our inner cubism. <laughs> we're excited, Car, and it's going to be good. Um, on December 4th, those of us that are in LA or are willing to travel to LA, we are going to the Book of Mormon, the musical. It's a field trip. So if you still want to get in on this, contact one of us and let us know and we can try to all get tickets together. It's going to be really fun. And we have some other things going on with our California book club members, um, meet and greets and things like that. So that's coming up um, December 4th. Now on to our bonus event. Uh, today, tonight, we are so excited to be hearing from Darren Perry. We have been trying to get him here to talk to book club for a while since last winter when Landon, Melinda, Tom and I went to a hot springs event where he was telling stories, singing songs. We were all in a pool. There was steam everywhere. It was just this magical other world experience. And we thought we need to get, we need to get him and come charge our book club. So today we are really excited that it's finally actually happening. So I will read his bio really quick. Um, I'm going to use a piece of paper because I'm old and blind, <laughs> but you guys can read along. Darren Perry is the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. Darren served on serves on the board of directors for the American West Heritage Center in Wellsville, Utah, the Utah Humanities Board, and the PBS Utah Board of Directors. He attended the University of Utah and Weber State University and received his bachelor's degree in secondary education with an emphasis on history. Darren is the author of... The Bear River Massacre, A Shoshone History, which is an amazing book. A lot of us have read this. Um, he teaches Native American history at Utah State University. His passions in his life are his wife, Melody, seven children, and 17 grandchildren. His other passion is his tribal family. He wants to make sure that those who have gone before him are not forgotten. So what we're going to do is Darren's going to talk to us for about half an hour, and then we are going to be able to ask questions and have a little more of a discussion. So if you have questions while Darren's talking, you can put it in the chat so that we can revisit it later. But now we'll just turn the time over to Darren. Welcome. Thank you. And I remember that pool day <laughs> like it was yesterday. <laughs> And if you haven't been up to Maple Grove Hot Springs, make sure you go. It's beautiful. And I think I'm doing something later this month up there again. And so they've been good friends to me. And they donate uh, every Black Friday. They have a Black Friday deal. And they donate all the proceeds to our interpretive center, the construction of that. So, But let me give you some background a little bit. And I'll talk about just some history in general and i i'm a history nerd i grew up being a history nerd i went into secondary education so i could teach history and never really got a job in a high school and so but i'm in schools every day all day it seems like so and then i hope there's a lot of questions ask anything uh i just gave a lecture in washington dc on Lamanite identity. So uh, that has to do with the church and uh, when we're going to turn white and delightsome. So nothing's off off board. And I, I hope uh, you read my book in the spirit of the way I learned through oral history telling. 
So American history for a long time was written and taught as a single narrative. It was a, a narrative of nation building that united all of its participants into this single American experience. I think looking back on it, it was a national success story uh, made possible in a society that we believe is based on principles of liberty and equality and justice for all, or so we thought. In years past, it's been my experience that historians have sometimes often ignored or dismissed peoples whose experiences didn't conform to that master narrative. And many times uh, left out was the story of the American Indian. After all, our story is one of decline and suffering rather than one of progress or happiness. And as a result, there was a famous historian named Frederick E. Hoxie, who said that the Indian story was not the American story. So it would be best to leave it out. When the Indian story was told, it was usually portrayed as one feudal resistance to the march of civilization. Just like in the movies, Indians were portrayed as hostile towards the pioneers. Images of savage warriors attacking pioneer uh, wagon trains became firmly fixed in our minds in concepts made well known by Hollywood. When Indians were not killing settlers, it was usually a history of the federal government trying to solve this great Indian problem. In many classrooms in most history books, Indians were either conspicuous by their absence or viewed in such stereotypical ways that it distorted us and robbed us of our humanity and our identity. But times change and the history and the stories that we tell about the past changes too. 50 years ago, few colleges or universities offered courses in American Indian studies and history. But that's changed. Political pressure from activists, students, and scholars became active and now there's new college courses. And we're now beginning to re-examine this Native American experience. Understanding the past allows us and makes us look at the viewpoints of many people who have made it over the centuries. And Native Americans must be included as a major strand in the history of this country. After all, our nation was built on Indian land. And it requires us to look beyond the stereotypes and rethink some basic assumptions that we've always had about history. In, 19, in 1892, in a speech at a conference on social reform, Richard H. Pratt, who many of you may not know, he's the father of the modern day boarding school, quoted General Sherman, Philip Sheridan, um, excuse me, who notoriously said, the only good Indian I ever saw was dead. And then Pratt in his speech said this, I agree with this sentiment only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. I think that sums up colonial America's response to the vexed Indian problem. How can we completely destroy a culture that has existed since time immemorial? And how can we tell them now just to forget about it, get, move on? If you were to drive past uh, north along Highway 91, just past Preston, Idaho today, you'll round a curve that, um, opens to this panoramic view of the Bear River bottomlands below. 
on a cold winter day, if you know where to look, you can still see the steam rising from its edges. It was 158 years ago at that exact spot that some 700 members of the Shoshone people were spending their winter as they'd done for centuries. Hot springs nearby provided a place for them to catch their breath, catch up with family and friends during the cold winter months. We called that place Moso de Guani, which means home of the lungs. A half a mile to the southeast, Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, had that same bird's eye view on that cold January morning in 1863, as they made their way down a ravine towards the sleeping Indian village. When something terrible happens where human lives were lost, it seems to take on a different meaning. Let me explain the 14.6 acres of the World Trade Center, the beaches of Normandy, a homemade memorial at the side of the road where a fatal traffic accident occurred, places that haunt and hurt for the wounds that they hold, but they still compel us to go back for some unexplainable reason and comfort. For hundreds of years, the banks of the Bear River provided my people with a wintering camp spot. We called this place Bo Ogai, which means big river. The river's hot springs offer warmth, renewal, and a place for us to catch our breath in the cold winter months. But that peace was shattered on the morning of January 29th in 1863, when Connor invaded that campsite and killed everyone they encountered. We believe more than 450 Shoshones lost their lives that day. Two thirds of that number being women and children. Have you ever had a memory sneak out of your eye and roll down your cheek? I have that all the time when I think about the massacre of my people. Over the years, in fact, I was there today, the riverbanks of Boa Ogai became a site of honor where those bodies still lie. Frozen ground and fear of returning soldiers prevented those who may have wanted to bury the dead from burying them. Uh, a few of the bodies were thrown into the river, but for the most part, many were left for the animals and the elements. Chief Sagwich, the chief at the time, my great, great, great grandfather, led the survivors away from Bo Ogai to seek safety elsewhere. But that site remains a sacred burial ground for those victims who were lost on that morning. Their voices still speak to me from the dust. If you're there at just the right time in the evening, you can sit and you can hear the cries of the little ones crying for their mothers. You don't have to see things as they were to know that a terrible injustice had taken place, you can feel it. But we remember and we honor the past because it allows us to succeed in the future. Someone once told me that never let your past experiences harm your future. Your past cannot be altered and your future doesn't deserve the punishment. In the years that followed the story of the so-called Battle of Bear River, was always told from the soldier's perspective. But I know this was no battle and my grandmother knew it too. And she fought for years to tell her own story. I remember as a boy, one day she's sitting me down and saying, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. One day you will have to make them listen. I want you to know a couple of things. I haven't had to make anybody listen, but I really didn't recognize the significance of what she was telling me as a young boy. You see, she was born early in the 1900s. So she grew up in the 20s, 30s and 40s. She was a woman 
And I'd say a woman didn't have much of a voice back then. But not only was she a woman, she was a woman of color, which probably made it extra hard. So what was lost on me as a young boy was all of that. And her telling me that one day you'll have to make them listen. It's because she never had a voice. And she spoke her whole life to tell our story in our unique way. Imagine for a minute if your family's life was disrupted or destroyed by European settlers. Imagine if you were driven from your lands, forbidden to speak your language or express your culture. Diseases like smallpox and tuberculosis were introduced to you in the form of warm blankets that were given to you in a form of comfort. Imagine having your food source, the great bison, nearly driven to extinction. Imagine your people, your tribe, being pitted against other tribes. And that lack of unity between tribes allowed the settlers to take more lands. Imagine having your children ripped from your arms and placed in faraway boarding schools where they faced abuse and sometimes death at every turn where they were punished for speaking their language or talking about their culture. They were being taught the white man ways. They were being taught to speak English only and were taught to stifle that native American heritage as if that was the answer. Worst of all, they were taught to be ashamed of being a Native American. Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart, I love that name. How could I not get that name? Said that historical trauma is the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over one's lifetime from generation to generation, following the loss of life, loss of lands, and vital aspects of your culture. It is, it any, is it any wonder that Native American communities are facing serious difficulties? These difficulties are symptoms of unresolved historical trauma and how, they, how the effects of those collective injuries, such as genocide and discrimination, can still linger for generations. I've thought about this a lot, and I thought, you know what? I'm a sixth generation removed from many of them, those historical traumas and the violence afflicted upon my people. So I didn't live then. I don't know what that was like. However, I still have daily thoughts about the loss of our language, the loss of our culture. I experience anger regarding these historical losses. I have daily thoughts of the effects of alcohol and drugs in our community. And I want to blame colonial America for much of that. Furthermore, it's easy for me to see why many of our native peoples have a distrust of the intentions of the dominant white culture due to our historical losses of our people. Many Native Americans today still have daily thoughts of loss, stress, grief, discrimination, and cultural displacement. Many generations of Native Americans live under the shadow of history, and this can cause enormous stress on the body and mind. After all, half of writing history is about hiding the truth. So how do we heal? Why are we still talking about old history? Do us, does it do us any good to dwell on the past? Or are we just supposed to move on? It's one of the reasons I wrote the book. We need to talk about the history. We need to talk about it from the perspective of the American Indian because we need to understand how some of this history is still affecting Native American communities today. 
you know, back in the day, <clears throat> young people would sit at the feet of their elders and the elders would tell them stories. The stories were always the same. There was never a word out of place. They had to be that way. They had to be accurate. Our children needed to hear the stories as the elders had heard the stories because in our culture, nothing was ever written down. I went through the same process with my grandmother, May Timbimbu Perry. <clears throat> I remember her sitting for hours and telling me stories about how the coyote stole fire or how the bald eagle became bald. And then with a tear in her eye and sometimes a quiet, reverent tone, she would relate the story of the massacre of Bo Ogai. Because of these stories, I developed this great love for history. And then one day it all became clear to me. Um, I was sitting in class and the teacher said, next week we're going to talk about Native Americans in Utah and we're going to start with the Shoshone. Well, I was excited. My friends knew that I was Shoshone, but I didn't really talk about my culture with them. I wasn't embarrassed. We just didn't talk about those things. Uh, that Monday came, the teacher began talking about the Shoshone people. And as she talked, I thought to myself, what is she even saying? I don't recognize any of this. How could that be? I had always believed that the historical events and people were an absolute. I thought she could at least get that right. But she didn't. She talked about something that was completely foreign to me about my people. And then I realized that none of the stories that my grandmother told me are in our history books. And then one day I read a quote that was attributed to the great English leader, Winston Churchill. And, and he made it crystal clear to me when I read his quote, it said, uh, history is only written by the victors. Well, to me then that makes perfect sense why Native American histories are never written. And especially from the perspective of the Shoshone people but they need to be, we need to talk about it. And it's not because we're looking to have things made right. I don't believe that at all, but I believe those who lived back then, those who died at Bear River, I believe they have a God-given right to be heard. Their story needs to be told. When my grandmother told me no one has ever wanted to hear our story before, one day you'll have to make them listen. As uh, someone who gets to share my culture almost every day now with people, I have never had to make anybody listen. I think we live in a time of truth telling. And I think people want to know, and especially our youth. I'm so happy with the state of where, where our youth are at, really. Um, I've always been greeted with absolute kindness and then willing to want to learn. And so for that, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, I've been given a platform to share, even though some of our legislatures and others, government are trying to maybe stifle things that might not, might not be comfortable to talk about. But we got to push back. We got to push back. I think the best decisions are made uh, as a society when you have multiple perspectives and we can share these multiple perspectives on every level. And I want you to know there's many in our society today that have never had a voice, not just Native Americans, but other uh, groups that have never had a seat at the table, never had a chance to share their culture. And, and that's sad to me. We need to make a safe platform where all peoples can come together and share what they want to do. So my book, when I wrote that book, it was just, uh, 
a continuation of what my grandmother wanted to do. She always told me she wanted to write a book. She lived back in the time and day when you had that old typewriter. She would hammer out everything on this old typewriter. And, and I just look back on it today and think, no wonder. And then she got Parkinson's disease and she just ran out of time, couldn't finish her project. So for me, it was an easy thing. I wanted to write this story of my grandmother's people and my people to just continue to uh, finish what she started, I guess you could say. When I first wrote it, I want you to know, I my friends are academics. They're college professors. And, and when I first wrote the book, it seems so little and simple to me. I was kind of embarrassed when I went around my academic friends because I thought I look at their history books and they're so thick and they have sources and footnotes and and my book's not that. It's it's a way, uh, well, it's not that. And at first I was kind of embarrassed to be around them because I thought literary wise, it wasn't something that um, they would respect. And then one day I was in Preston, Idaho, and I was there today, but I, I was at the gas station in Preston and I was pumping gas. It was uh, two summers ago. And a farmer pulled up next to me. His, he had boots on, coveralls, and, and he just stared at me as he was pumping this gas. And then he asked, are you Darren Perry? Well, I've learned to be very apprehensive when people ask that question. So I said timidly, yes, I am. And he said, after a pause, he said, I read your book. And again, I didn't know where this conversation was going to go. And I had thoughts of, oh my gosh, is he going to be angry at me because I wrote about his community and maybe his ancestors? And, and then he said, I want you to know it was like sitting around a campfire and hearing stories that I'd heard my whole life. Whew. Well, after a big sigh from me, I thought, you know what? That's the way I wanted it to be. I wanted it to be the way I learned from a grandmother sitting around and telling me stories. That's the way Shoshones disseminate knowledge. That's the way we teach values to our kids. Uh, that's the way we educate them. Whenever I speak to a bunch of fourth graders, one of the questions they get is, because they were hunters and gatherers, they always ask me, well, when did they have time to go to school? And I said, winter was always the elders' time to tell stories. And that's when they disseminated knowledge and that's where they learned things. And so they always are mad that they never had a formal school to go to. But that's when we learned lessons of life and values that would accompany us for the rest of our lives. And then we would pass them on with our youth. So I'm so grateful the the book has been a success i mean i'm just very grateful but one thing i want you to know before we take questions is that uh i tell every fourth grade class that i go to i want you to know we're still here we're resilient the native american people have survived everything that the u.s government has thrown at us since 1776 and before we're still here we're our governments are still strong and in some cases our languages are too and some of us are losing those but we're doing things to revitalize some of those things that we're losing in 2018 we were able to purchase all of the bear river massacre site this was only the beginning to tell the story of a people 
my next thought was to build this beautiful interpretive center on the site. One, so we would tell the story of the people and the way they lived. But more than anything else, uh, it's important that we tell the story of the people, but it's equally as important that we tell the story of the land. And to me, that's half the story. I call it the land restoration. Restoring the land to what it looked like in 1863, removing non-invasive non -invasive plants and trees and replanting new ones uh, that will allow the hit land to heal. My grandmother always referred to our plants and animals and water as our plant, animal, and water kinfolk. Well, if you call somebody your kinfolk, that is a different relationship that we have with, with that individual or those, those things, the environment. So that's the way I learned. My environment is, is everything. And my environment and my relationship to it is equally as important as the story of the people is. And so I've been so grateful for the opportunity that I've been given to share the story of our people and share the story of the land. Uh, before we take questions, let me end with this one thing that I was able to, whenever I go to an elementary school, I get the opportunity to talk to the kids about this culture. But one day I asked a second grader, I made the mistake of asking her a question. I said, who has any questions? And the second grader raised her hand and she said, how did you get to be the chief? And I said, I told her this story. I said, one day when a Shoshone boy or girl does an act of kindness or service, that boy or girl in the tribe would get one eagle feather from the chief. I then said to this girl, what do you think would happen if that boy or girl kept doing kind things for people? And she said, well, obviously they'd get more eagle feathers. I said, what if that boy or girl kept doing kind things until they became an adult? What do you think would happen then? And she said, well, by then they would have so many eagle feathers. And I said, you're right. And I said, one day when the chief gets ready to die, and the chief is always the chief until he dies, he will call everyone together and he'll say, I'm about to meet my maker. I need to select a new chief. I want all of you to pull out your eagle feathers and show them to me. And then I told this girl, it was a person that had the most eagle feathers would become the new chief. You see, the chief isn't the bravest or the toughest or the strongest. The chief is always the one who led a life of service and kindness. And so I always tell the kids before I go, go be a chief today. You're not going to be a Shoshone chief, but if you live a life of kindness and service, you will become a leader in your community. You will become a leader that people want to follow. Leadership that is not rooted in power and authority, but in service and kindness and wisdom. So I always leave that story with the youth. Go be a chief. Make a difference in your community. Because we certainly know the world needs that kind of leadership today. So thanks for having me. And I want to open it up to questions. And nothing's off limits. So thank you. I just want to say thank you so much, Darren. And I think that's not just a lesson for second graders. That is a lesson for all of us. So thank you so much for sharing such a beautiful, powerful, important story. Now, I think we had several questions coming in in the chat while we were while you were talking. I'm wondering, Landon, would you want to scroll through those real quick and see if there's a couple that you could pull out to ask? And then everyone can just raise their hands and, and Darren can just take the questions. But I want to make sure that we hit those questions. Some of them were really good that I saw coming in in the chat. Sure. So Brad, Brad Farmer asks, um, what are the prevailing thoughts among Native American active Latter-day Saints regarding the Lamanite curse? 
Well, I don't know what the, I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> and I, I can speak to that. Uh, there's some things, look, just full disclosure. I'm a sixth generation Shoshone Latter-day Saint. I'm still currently active. And I, I try to exist in a church that frankly isn't very good to people of color and, and Native Americans and and some of the stories we get out of the Book of Mormon and not only stories, but some of the teachings of some of the President Kimball gave some talks about turning white as I mean, comparing brothers from a Native American family, one went to church, one didn't. Th those are problematic for sure. And uh, I have a hard time reconciling most of that for sure. You might ask the second question, which is always the follow up. If you think that, then why do you stay? Great question. And it's an honest question. I stay for one reason. I stay because I believe in the pure gospel doctrine of Jesus Christ. What he taught, his scriptures, the way he lived his life, who he went and preached to, who he healed, that. I have a testimony of that. I felt the spirit. I, I believe in that. Men, not so much. I have a hard time with men. I have a hard time with not being able to apologize. I just think men screw it up. Even, even in scripture times, there isn't one prophet in Bible, Book of Mormon, any other thing that didn't get in trouble big time because they screwed it up somehow. And they were always being called to repentance. If prophets that lived long ago had that, have, were being chastised all the time, wouldn't it follow suit that they're capable of making mistakes today? Brigham Young said some horrific things about Native Americans, and I just chalk it up to him being a man. His biases, his racism played into a lot of decisions he made. And so I kind of look at the modern church the same way today. And, and maybe I stay because I want to be a backstop to even worse things happening. I want to make sure that uh, there's a voice there for those people who don't feel like they have a voice. And look, I'm, I'm confident enough to stand up for them and say something. Now, they may kick me out of the church one of these days real soon. I'm, I'm sure they have a file on me two inches thick. <laughs> but, but for now, I choose to stay. But there's some problematic doctrine that uh, needs to be addressed and apologized for, for sure. Thank you. Um, Bruce asks, among the uh, Native Americans in Utah, Idaho, Arizona, is there much discussion of the Indian placement program that was run by the church? And did you participate in that at all? You know what? There's been a lot of discussion lately, and I don't know why. I maybe because I've been hanging out with a lot of Navajo people. Uh, that program was almost exclusively for the Navajo, and so as a Shoshone, look, I didn't grow up on a reservation. My life, I lived a privileged life. I'll just tell you right now, uh, it was different from reservation life. So. Uh, I don't. I didn't experience some of them horrific things that other my native brothers and sisters did. The Navajo, the placement program. It may have started out as a worthy thing, but it wasn't. It was just an extension of what the government was trying to do to us: kill the Indian to save the man. And so uh, that was the whole boarding school concept. The church just did it under the guise of religion. I, I don't want to speak for all Navajos that went through it because I think there's some that really enjoyed their experience and have stayed in touch with many family members of who they lived with. 
So I don't want to dismiss their experience, but I think it was, uh, there's plenty that had traumatic experiences take place too. And so you can't really just say one, one size fits all because it didn't. Yeah, that, that was my question. I have a, a cousin who was Navajo or is Navajo, uh -huh. lived with my cousin's family and she's still, you know, she's still part of the family and she's 65, she's my age, she's 65. And I saw all of the younger cousins and her daughter hiking in Nepal this weekend, this week. Okay. And so her family had integrated into my Mormon family. And I believe the the daughter works for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and is a believing Mormon. I've never, I know her mom better than I know her, but uh, it, it's interesting how that, uh, you know, that dynamic kind of worked. I, I think it was problematic, but with this one person that entered our family, she's one of my cousins and it's interesting. Yeah, it is. And the, there's just so many, I've heard so many good experiences. And then I've hear, heard some absolute horror stories. And so the problem with the program is they were doing this program to get rid of the Native American in us as if that was a problem as if that was a sin and and making our skins turn lighter would would solve it all that's the problem i mean yeah there were some good things that come out of it but my gosh they just were trying to perpetuate in the name of religion what the government had been trying to do for 300 years so mixed bag i'm afraid all right thank you uh the next one actually was by me uh you you'd mentioned that you uh, that uh, American that they're teaching Native American history in the universities now, uh, which is probably a good thing. But I'm assuming they're teaching it out of textbooks, which isn't really a Native American way of learning. And my experience of standing, uh, you know, on the massacre site and looking down, reading the signs, and just feeling the emptiness and listening to the wind was so. That, that it was so powerful and it taught me so much. Are there are there other ways or other places that you can go where you can learn the history in more of a native way as opposed to textbooks and, and that kind of thing? Good question. I, I think uh, I think when you can can get hold of a local tribe and see when they're holding cultural experiences that everybody can come to powwows are obviously the top thing but to immerse yourselves with tribal cultures and, and see how the tribes do it themselves some are way more organized and better than others uh i know here in the cache valley we had powwows every year the first one of the year in may at utah state university and covid shut that down and we haven't had one since and We've been trying to raise money to revitalize that and bring it back. But there's other Native Americans. I, I'm part of a group that does sweat lodges. Uh, and so I'll invite some of my friends to come that have expressed interest in participating in a sweat lodge. But there's so many things you can learn uh, from an elder, a tribal elder, uh, about the religion and about ceremony and the importance of it. But yeah, you're right. The, the things that are out there, there's not a lot out there. I am the only one here at Utah State University that teaches Native American studies. I mean, you're right. Imagine that, a Native American teaching Native American studies. And the good thing is we've gotten better with the history books that are written today. I think people are realizing that history has been so one-sided for so long there's many Native American scholars out there now. And so I think it's easier today to find that Native American experience from their perspective where, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you could never find it. You can find it if you look hard enough today. Behind me, I've got books and books and books of good Native American 
uh, books. That was written. actually one of the questions is what, what books would you recommend that are, you know, the most accurate or true? Oh, Ned Blackhawk wrote one, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's really good. Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee will rip your yeah, heart really, right out. Really good one. <laughs> and so, you know, there's just, there's others that are out there. In fact, you could probably do a Google search of Native American authors and, and almost read anything. Uh, my One of my favorite books is uh, Robin Wall Kimmer. I'm sure you've read it. We just, we just finished grass. it. Yes, <laughs> just last month. <laughs> okay. That's one of my all-time favorites. And I've read it like four times, but then I listened to it. And I'll tell you, if you've not listened to it, get the audio version and listen to it yeah. because she speaks in a slower tone. She speaks the way my grandmother told me stories. And I loved when she giggled in it. I mean, there's just little nuances that you don't get from reading the words yourself on, on the page. So I, any of you that have not listened to it, if you want a whole new experience to bring Sweetgrass, uh, get the audio version and listen to it. I'm working on an audio version of mine. I I need like 10 minutes to myself. So I, but that's in the works soon that I will be reading that book too. And then it'll come across a little more like I learned, I, I hope so. But uh, those are a couple of my recommendations. Great, that, that's real interesting. Listen to the stories by the Native Americans as opposed to reading the book because that's how they, very interesting. Um, uh, S. Weiser said, do, do you still have your grandmother's papers? All of them. I have boxes and boxes of her notebooks, of everything she wrote down by hand. She wrote in cursive. And let me tell you, <laughs> I mean, I can write in cursive because I'm probably the last generation to ever have to do that. But she wrote in this beautiful cursive writing that you have to double take to see what she's saying. But uh, I have all of it and it's a treasure to me. One thing we did though, is we digitized everything and Utah State University is going to house that in their special collections. And it will be available for everybody to look at online. So it's not just, you know, gonna go on a shelf deep in the catechism of Utah State University. We wanted to make sure everything's available for people to research and look at. And, uh, so there's there's much there and hopefully we'll be able to share it soon. All right, thanks. Um, I asked, uh, I think I asked all the questions. Some, there, there are more questions. I think Brad, you asked several, but I wanted to let Jackie ask hers and then uh, Brad, I'll let you ask, uh, ask your others. Uh, uh, just a quick thank you, thank you for this book. My husband and I considered it an honor to read and so appreciate you putting it in writing, Darren, and um, educating us. So my question is, at the end of the book, uh, your um, family members and those of the tribe went to the church office building to talk about their homes being burned. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering if the church ever uh, financially gave you your tribe and the people in their uh, money for that awful tragedy and kind of was there any closure with that what was the end of the story it kind of left me hanging you know the yeah and I didn't say because we didn't get anything even the people that were burned out didn't get anything I was afraid of that but yeah. that's about right for the church I mean they just don't apologize and they usually don't make reparations like that, even though that's what they've told me in my whole life. If I make a mistake, that's what I do. And so the funny thing was my dad was in that meeting and my grandmother, my dad at the time was the director of Indian affairs for the state of Utah. His office was in the Capitol building. He was, he was very affluent and he very educated and, uh, we went there with the letters written by the people that had been burned out and lost everything. And, you know, 
nothing, silence, nothing came out of it. And still to this day. But let me let me tell you this. Uh, the church made a sizable donation to the mass to our interpretive center. They were the very first ones to donate. And it was significant, I'll have to say. And they've been they've been very good to me in that way. But I absolutely felt like an apology needed to happen and reparations of some kind uh, needed to take place for those, especially for those who were burned out. And so, but what I found interesting, and I don't know if you read it the same way I did, every one of those letters from those people talked about everything they've lost. They were heart-wrenching, but then they all bore testimony about the truthfulness of the church at the end of their letters, every one of them, and said, you know, at the end, even though we've lost everything, we still don't, we still believe in the church. Man, I don't know if I could have the strength to do that. I'm afraid I would have been saying, see you later. And, you know, until you can make it right. But uh, they were very faithful members. And so maybe to a fault, I don't know. I appreciate your thoughts on that. And I would also wonder, you know, again, this generational trauma and being able to bear a testimony because with trauma, you always go into shame and maybe I deserved it or thought so. Yeah. It gets complicated. But, you know, I want to honor their testimony and honor where they came from. And uh, nobody has a right to judge that situation. But, um, you did leave me hanging. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was, that. Afraid, I was I, afraid that would be the answer. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah. 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 Maybe I ought to go in and edit it because where I have it published, I can go change anything anytime I want. And, well, I, uh, I think it'd I really be, I think, I think uh, anytime uh, there's some, some written pushback that the world sees, it, might get some more money given to that uh, <laughs> your center, but I think uh, I think that's the way to go. They I read a, a line in the Wall Street Journal probably twenty years ago now that said, in regards to the church, they said the Church of Jesus Christ does some very good things, but they're obsessed with their appearance. <laughs> <laughs> I think that kind of calls it. So, write the second half in your book and embarrass them. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I, I hear what you're saying for sure. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the book. It was beautiful. And uh, I do think you absolutely captured the storytelling, which is um, a form of history. And it, it, yeah. it, it's, it's the, the purest form. And just as accurate. That's the thing. Abs they say more. You know, Lately, it's been coming out that it's more accurate. A couple of years ago, I went to the Western History Association conference in san antonio texas i gave a presentation and in the q a somebody said have you ever written anything and i said yeah i've got a book coming out called the bear of massacre shoshone history and a, a college professor from tcu texas christian she was there and she raised her hand and she said well i hope you use primary sources oh lord and i just thought i you know i I just had to stop for a minute and catch my breath and take a deep breath and not say anything negative. And <laughs> said, absolutely, I did. I used my grandmother's journals, May Timbimbu Perry's journals. That's that's my that's my sources. And and so I learned early on never to apologize for that kind of uh that, that oral history telling, the way we disseminate knowledge. Well, you don't get more of a primary source than that. That's for sure. Your <laughs> own grandmother's journal. So I think Brad had a question. And then I think a lot of us would like to know, how can we help? How can we donate? Okay. How can we? Okay. So let's have Brad ask some of his questions. And then I'd love to hear a little bit more about that before you have to go. Okay. Well, I, I definitely want to hear that, Rebecca. So I'll just... just uh... Uh, quickly ask one of them, and it's related. To, I have a friend who was in the Lamanite generation years ago, and and I'm just curious. He's <clears throat> he's since kind of recharacterized his own experience there, 
And I wonder what your thoughts are on that, the Lamanite generation and other efforts by the church to uh, preserve or showcase uh, the, the Native American culture, if there's better ways to, uh, to do it than what the church did. I think they were trying to do the right thing back then. I, I don't think you'll ever see another Lamanite generation group like that sponsored by BYU. Church is much more politically aware of how they've come across over time. And so, in fact, uh, just a, a quick experience. When I went down, the presiding bishop of the church who holds all the funds, we've become really good friends and close. And he had me at a dinner at his home. And he's from France. We had a simple meal, three hours long. I shared the history of our people for three hours. Then he invited me down to his office in what I call the large and spacious building, uh, 10th floor. He's on the 10th floor. I walked into a room of 20 people. I mean, him and his counselors, they all have assistants. There was attorneys, the church historian and people I've never seen before. And he said, Darren, take about 30 minutes and share, paraphrase what you told me, the history. And so I, I shared the history as good as I could in that quick a time. And but while I was doing it, the church historian was sitting next to me. His name was uh, Stephen Snow. He was a 70. He got really mad and he pounded the desk. And he said, when I was talking about the massacre, he said, the saints didn't kill anybody. And I said, well, you're kind of right. They didn't fire a bullet that day, but they were absolutely the cause. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry if that bothers you, but they were absolutely the cause. When you moved to Cache Valley and depleted all of the resources, that my hunting and gathering people needed and they were left to beg for food, starve or steal, you left them with no options. And so uh, he was really mad about that. But I kept, in this meeting, I kept referring to my people as Lamanites. This was making all of them really uncomfortable. I could tell, by every time I'd say it, They'd squirm or something and smile or, and finally I said, I said, it seems that you guys get uncomfortable when I mention the term Lamanite. And I said, you've been telling me my whole life, I'm a Lamanite. Joseph Smith said, I'm a Lamanite. 20 prophets after Joseph Smith said, I'm a Lamanite. And now what? You're not sure? Why? Because of DNA and other things? I said, tell me, were, were those guys wrong? And, and not a word. Not a word. And I said, look, I don't care if it makes you uncomfortable. You've been telling me my whole life I'm a Lamanite, and it's a source of pride for me. And I said, look, the Book of Mormon, according to you guys, the book was written to my people for us. And my people are going to play a prominent role in the last days. With or without you guys' help, the Lamanites will bring forth the gathering of Zion. So I said, don't you dare tell me something that's been a a source of pride for me and my role in the last days. Don't you dare take that away because you're not quite sure now. I said, uh uh, I'll identify as a Lamanite for now. And if I learn later on that I was wrong, I'll admit I was wrong. But I said, we've got a role to play. And then I said, think about the world we live in today. It's screwed up, it's not good. We're as divided now as ever. You don't think the world needs this Native American wisdom today and going forward? I said, if we're ever going to save ourselves, we need this Native American wisdom, this Lamanite wisdom. And I left it at that with them.
but yeah, we've had that conversation numerous times and I don't know. I just know I'm probably not that smart of a guy and, but uh, I just continue to believe what I've always been taught for now till I know better. So Bruce, did you have a question real quick? Well, I just looked up Stephen Snow. He was the church historian. Was he a and lawyer? They they mentioned nothing about his education or career. So I assume he was one of the lawyers. Yeah. I think he, he, he is. A, I think he was a lawyer. I think him and his family's from St. George. Okay. And look, he's a good friend now. Oh. I mean, we got to be pretty good friends after that, but it oh. was tense for a few minutes. If, if, if they're from St. George and their name's Snow, uh, my niece has married into that family. I didn't okay. know that. But, you know, you're just going like, that was a bad PR move saying something that the church was kind of culpable in. And that appearance thing is you know, the most important thing with the church. Sure. It, it is interesting. Do, do the Native Americans in the church and or in your experience, is there any discussion of like DNA and, and things like that? Is that a topic? It, there is. And uh, in July, a professor friend of mine, her name's Farina King. She's a, prof she's a, Navajo. She's a professor at Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. She called me and said, I want to sponsor a Lamanite identity co uh, conference in Salt Lake. We had it at the University of Utah over three days. And 40 presenters. I was one of them. These are all Lamanite, well, Native American people that had been affiliated with the church. Mm. Guess how many are still in the church? Three. Yeah. Three. And I'm one of them. And Farina was one of them. And one other person. But we had Lamanites from Hawaii, uh, New Zealand, uh, just indigenous people that had been members of the church. 37 have left the church pretty much over the Lamanite identity question. And so, yeah, I'm one of three still hanging on for now. Well, it's an interesting narrative that sold in the 1800s, but upon closer examination doesn't quite make sense. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there for sure. And I know I'm not smart enough to know or figure it out, so. For now, I'll just go with what I've known. That's right. Do, do you think there. there'll ever be? Uh, do you think there'll ever be a Lamanite church historian? No. <laughs> They'd have no. to go to law school, obviously. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there was a Lamanite general authority. Well, there's yeah. been a couple, uh, George Lee. Yeah. And uh, his son and I are good friends on Twitter. <clears throat> Interesting perspective there. And then. Uh, Larry Echo Hawk was the last 70 and he's he turned 70 so they retire him at 70. I didn't know you when you turned 70 you couldn't be a 70 anymore. It, too bad they don't retire everybody at 70. Uh, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'm not touching that one. <laughs> no. No, let's keep it good. Keep it good. So would you like to tell us Darren a little bit um just about what we can do to help how we can get the word out, how we can donate, just anything like that. I mean, I've also been to the Bear River Massacre site. I went at the same time, Landon and Melinda and Tom there. And and boy, when you stand there, you that you can just feel it. Even if you didn't know anything happened there, you would know that something happened there. It was yeah, just there's incredible. And, and to have a center there will be just amazing because we, we went around and we looked at all the plaques. We looked at all the different markers. Mm -hmm. We talked to some local people there, but we still thought this story needs to be told, you know, in a way that everybody can, can access it. So we were really excited to hear this interpretive center was happening. So please tell us a little bit about that and then we'll let you get on. Okay. Well, just briefly in the chat, I put boaogai.org. That is a website you can go to and it'll share pictures, history. Uh, it has a secured link to donate if you want to just make a donation. 
from that website you can and it's secure um it's a tax write-off too just so you know so anything you donate can be tax deductible or a non-profit but uh i think you know i've been raising the money i'm the only one raising money i've raised almost five million dollars for the building uh i've raised 6.6 .6 million for the land restoration but with grants and other things, uh, we're doing a lot with the land right now. I'm about two. Well, building costs have gone up so much that uh, it's a moving target for the building. But I think another two million will about do it. And mm. I have high hopes that that'll happen soon. So I've got some people that I've talked to that I think can really make a difference. But every ten dollar donation helps, like really helps. And so you can you can donate on that bowoldguy.org. And you can learn more about the project and learn more about the history of our people from that website too. Yeah, where where is this located at? It's about three miles north of Preston, Idaho, southeast okay. Idaho. It's yeah. on the road that goes to Downey and Pocatello from the Cache Valley, right there on the road, right on the Bear River. Why, with this being the largest uh, largest uh, uh, murder, I guess you could call it, uh, 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 west of the Mississippi, I think, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's strange that the government's not stepping up or uh, doing something to preserve. I mean, this is this is big. I mean, 300, 300 people were massacred. Yeah. Oh, no, 450. We 450. Believe. Oh, geez. Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. The National Park Service offered to build a building. And they said, we are going to run it if we do. Mm. And so I turned that down. Good. good I'm still trying to get money from our legislators back in DC. I ran for Congress two years ago. The kid that beat me, I think he's trying to help us get an appropriation or a, get some funding somehow that way. The state of Utah actually almost donated a million dollars to uh, that site. So the state of Idaho hasn't donated any. And I'm working on the state of Idaho still. Mm. And it's hard for me to get up to Boise. It's a four and a half hour drive. Uh, but when I speak Thursday night, I'm staying overnight and I'm going to go meet lawmakers and others that can help in Idaho just to push them along a little bit. But yeah, they can't, they can't have a building in their state and not donate to it. So hopefully, I, I think they'll do the right thing one of these days. That, that, that's really, I, I really like that you're doing that, that you, you're saying we get to tell our story because, you know, we, we, we went down to the, uh, uh, well, the, Mount, the, Mount, the Mount, Mount Meadow Mount. Massacre. <laughs> and, and yeah, it, it's like the story's not being told because, <laughs> you know, the people don't get to tell their own story and you're kind of scratching your head sometimes going, What's the real story here? So I, yeah. I think it's great that you you're telling your own story. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, thank you, Darren, so much. Oh my goodness, this has just been an yeah. amazing evening. And we're mm -hmm. gonna share the links to how to donate and with the rest of our book club members. We record this because a lot of people can't attend. So this will be viewed quite a bit because a lot of people were very interested in it. So let's go to our very quickly final slide and then we'll just end and say goodbye. Really quick. Okay, just another reminder, Hunter Gatherer's Guide is our next book. Everybody grab that, start listening or reading. That'll be November 13th. And if you're not a member of the Good Book Club and you would like to be, find us on Facebook, the Good Book Club, Instagram. Send me an email at thegoodbookclub at mail.com and come join us. We have lots of fun reading and having wonderful bonus events like this and meeting incredible people like Darren. So we always love to have new members. So that being Thank said. Thank you, everyone. Good Thank night, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank Darren. you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Bye bye. Thank you.